So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Cynthia Holtz and I am the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries, uh, which is hosting this webinar. Um, I would like to just uh, uh, do a few housekeeping things to start off and then I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Head. Um, the webinar will be recorded um, and it will be posted to the call webinar site and YouTube channel shortly after the session is over. Um, I will send a message out to everybody who registered, letting them know that the recording has been posted. Uh, we ask that if you are not speaking, that you keep yourself muted and also turn off your cameras to save bandwidth for those uh, folks attending in uh, low bandwidth areas so that they can have a, a good meeting experience as well. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Rachel Head, who is the chair, the, one of the co-chairs of our Indigenous Knowledge Committee. Rachel. Yeah, uh, Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, the Mi'kmaq Ecological Calendar based on the 13 moons. I'm Rachel Head talking to you all today from Unamagi, the land of fog, Cape Breton Island, and the ancestral home of the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, before the session begins, I'd like to begin today's session with a little land acknowledgement. Call CBPA represents uh, member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of, of uh, Nunatsiavut and Nunatkvut, the Innu of Mitasinin, the Beothic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wellistakie, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaguati peoples. We at Call CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the First Peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. And I'm so happy to be introducing Gerald Gloy today. Jalasi, welcome, Gerald. Thank, Thank you, you for coming back to do another session. Um, Gerald Gloyd is an innovative Mi'kmaq artist and educator for the um, for the, the Mi'kmaq Way. Uh, uh, DeBert Cultural Center. Uh, he began his career as a graphic designer for the Department of Natural Resources, Communications and Education branch more than uh, 25 years ago. And during uh, Canada's 150th year, his design of the Go Bit, the Beaver, was chosen for the Royal Canadian Mints, My Canada, My Inspiration coin design contest. Also as a storyteller, he shares Mi'kmaq stories, legends, archeology, span and history through his presentations with a variety of audiences. Gay, please take it away, Gerald. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that introduction. And again, unfortunately, I can't see the faces of these people that are online, but um, like I said, uh, I should be no stranger at this point. <laughs> I am coming to you from the um, Mi'kmaq de Burt Cultural Center which is um, taken care of by the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. And the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq is one of four tribal organizations that governs the Mi'kmaq here in the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, and as the name suggests, the Confederacy covers all the Mi'kmaq communities on the mainland part of Nova Scotia. Now this going off to CB goes to the Union of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq for all the governance a uh, body that governs all the ones up in Cape Breton Island. Uh, we do have a third one, which is the Nova Scotia Native Council, which represents the uh, natives that live off reserve, as well as non-status natives, as well as um, uh, C, was it, uh, la la la, I was gonna say, just trying to think of which ones they govern, but, um, but mostly the uh, the ones that live off reserve. And again, the fourth and final um, uh, governance agency is the old traditional uh, Grand Council, which still is very, very active. Now, as I said in my introduction, um, my claim to fame started off with the artwork and that's what I did with uh, education and communications was I started to work for natural resources and of course that native part of me pops out and doing everything with uh, natural resources from um, any illustrations of even Smokey the Bear to maps, <laughs> uh, just incorporating the concept of the Mi'kmaq map. 
and um, Mi'kma'ki, the land of the Mi'kmaq, representing the nine different districts that we have here in Mi'kma'ki. Uh, two of those are combined districts for a total of seven uh, governance bodies we can see there. And again, <clears throat> once a year during Mi'kmaq History Month, the month of October, we produce the Mi'kmaq History Month poster, which I know ends up in a lot of the schools as well as a lot of the libraries um, throughout the province here in Nova Scotia. And even uh, we share a lot of our um, Mi'kmaq History Month posters in um, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island as well. But again, everything from treaty expiration back in 2022, uh, 2020 was the International Year of Plant and Plant Knowledge. So we talked about the Mi'kmaq incorporation of plants. And even working with the Mi'kmaq History Month poster, that's what sort of spawned this one. And going back to 2024, I had done this painting and my boss said he really, really liked it. And we went with that one on um, Adeguin or the Mi'kmaq concept of um, communications. And when he found my painting, my original painting, he said that he wanted to use it for Mi'kmaq History Month. And I said, the name of this painting is Talking to the Moon. I said, the Mi'kmaq had 13 moon system and each name of each month is named after something that goes on in the environment. So it basically guides us into where we're supposed to be and when we're supposed to be there in order to harvest certain materials that are offered um, by the creator at different times of the year. And so the moon is a very, very important part of our culture. And that knowledge that we had is based on the moon. And even when Europeans came here and the Europeans were talking about the man and the moon, the Mi'kmaq were like, yeah, yeah, we got the man and the moon. And they're saying, yeah, you can see this faint little eyes and nose and the um, lips of this face. And we're like, no, that's not our version of the man and the moon. When you look at the Mi'kmaq man and the moon, it's a man sitting on a blanket and you can even see the headband going through his hair. And he's got his hand up by his mouth as well as the stem of a pipe. Now, the crater that's there on the moon, that there is his fireplace and uh, the fire that he's burning, it's uh, bellowing out some smoke. So this is the interpretation of the Mi'kmaq man in the moon and the way that we see it interpreted. And when again, when you take a look at that, you can definitely see that man sitting there with his headband on, sitting on his blanket by the fire. And uh, so that's just sort of a, our different interpretation of that man and the moon, but it's definitely part of our culture. And again, when the Europeans came here with their Gregorian calendar, the Julian calendar, it's like they had a 12 month system based on the planet's location on its journey around the sun. And uh, that's sort of breaking up into weird little denominations with January and December back to back and uh, you've got 31 days there. February, you've only got 28 days, but every uh, four years, you basically look out for February 29th. It's like they add one additional year every four years. And that there is the calendar that we use today. But the Mi'kmaq interpretation of the calendar was the 13 months based on the 13 times the moon goes around the earth as the earth goes around the sun. Now, the cool thing is uh, it takes 28 days for that cycle to go from full moon to full moon or from new moon to new moon. And 13 times, um, 13 times 28 gives you 364. We're sort of off by one day every year as opposed to just the six hours. So either way, it's still coming very, very close. And even when you consider the importance of the um, winter solstice and the summer solstice, as well as the two equinoxes, the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox, that sort of resets your calendar every year. It's just like those locations of uh, where the sun rises in the horizon. Uh, it's very, very uh, 
connected to our culture. So we do reset it, I guess. <clears throat> but again, our months and our 13 months were started with the dark of the moon. And they went on from the 28 phases of the moon until the dark of the following moon or the next new moon. And uh, that there is how our calendar ran. Everything um, started with the dark of the moon, ran for 28 days. And even with um, that 28 day cycle, uh, 28 divides into seven nicely into four and four times 13 is 52. And that's how many weeks we have a year. So yeah, we're looking pretty, pretty close. And even our names for the months of the year, I take a look at this graphic there. The red is from January to December, the, the ones that we use today. Uh, the big ma uh, interpretations of the month of the year are in the yellow. And being a verb-based language, uh, what they mean is in the white letters that you see there. Now you see the end of Every month ends with Eucus, and Eucus um, basically means the moon cycle that this happens. And then the prefix that's in front of it, like uh, Punamak Eucus, it's like that's the spawn, uh, spawn of the Tommy cod, and that's when the Tommy cod are coming in to, uh, to breed in January. So, like I said, verb based language takes that word and that meaning to a whole different level. Uh, one of our elders, uh, Mr. Ernest Johnson from Eskasoni, he said the Mi'kmaq were the first people to see. Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> because when you see a word or hear a word in Mi'kmaq, you understand its meaning. It evokes an image in your head. <laughs> and uh, the only exception to that rule is the month of February, a Puganajit. And a Puganajit is named that literally after our god of winter because February is the harshest and hardest month before we get out of winter and then everything starts anew in March and now uh, spring begins. But looking at this ecological calendar that was developed by the Elders Advisory Council as well as the, um, the Natural Resource Institute up of Unamagi up there in Cape Breton. And uh, this is uh, basically what it is, is the four seasons of the year and now, of course, we're divided up into three months per season to give us three times four is 12, 12 months of the year. This is what it is. But on this poster, you can see that there's more than one thing going on in each month. And what we have in our Mi'kmaq calendar is a main um, observation that we observe during that moon period. But there's other indicators that are going on at the same time. Like uh, even right now, it's like I haven't seen mayflowers yet, but I know mayflowers are out because the pussy willows are done. Once the pussy willows stop from that soft little furry part and they start to turn green and the pollen in there, they start to release that. As soon as you see that, you know the mayflowers are out. So like I said, be on the hunt for mayflowers and uh in your area, probably in a, a week or two, because there's sort of the plant hardiness zone of uh, when things become available at different parts of the province. Way down there in Shelburne and Yarmouth, way down in the more southerly part of the province, uh, they've probably had their mayflowers are probably done by now. Then ours are starting to kick in, and then yours will kick in a little later. Still a little cooler up there in Cape Breton. But getting on to our 13-month calendar, what a Macaulicus is a spawn of the Tommy cod. This fish comes in spawning during the month of January. And like most fish, they come in with the tides. Here in Nova Scotia, we got the world's highest tides. When the tide comes in, the fish stocks come in with it, and so do the ice cakes. Now, once it reaches um, the maximum and the tidal waters start to release and go back out, the ice jams up, but all the water from the tributaries that are flowing down from the streams and the brooks and the creeks into the rivers that head out to the bay, they get uh, dammed up by the ice. The ice overflows over the bank and it takes the fish with it. And then what happens is that ice dam breaks, the water drains out during its um, like twice daily tides, 
and our people would literally go along the banks and uh, pick fish. Uh, it's just that time of year, and again, that that um, action or that activity that we participated in in the month of January that gave us the name of that month. Uh, February, like I said, is named after the god of winter, Apuganajit. And uh, even like I said, the February observation of February 2nd during uh, Groundhog's Day, it's like uh, this little rodent comes out of his den and he doesn't see his shadow. He's, he's okay and we're going to have an early spring. But if he pops out of his den and he does see his shadow, he gets spooked and he goes back into his den. And we have another extended uh, few weeks of winter. So we know we're going to have a, a late spring on whenever he sees his shadow on February 2nd. Uh, we have a celebration that's very similar, but that there's the Feast of Apuganajit. And Apuganajit being the god of winter, we're trying to appease him, trying to make him happy. So he goes to sleep. So we have an early spring. So we put out an offering of food for him and the very first of February. So that way he gets a full belly, gets tired. And uh, we have different observations in different places. Now here in Millbrook, we do it on February 1st, the first day of the second month. Um, over in Button Keg, they do it the day before. They do it on the last day of January. It's that way that food offering is for like, them to receive uh, on that first day of the second month. Now the Cape Bretoners, the Cape Bretoners are old school. Um, they know that in the old Mi'kmaq calendar, that the days were only 28 days long. So they put their offering out on January 10, 29th, which would literally be the first day of the second month in our old school calendar. But like I said, the, a lot of the knowledge and the language and a lot of our culture is still super strong in Cape Breton. And uh, yeah, they observe things a little differently. And again, looking at that 20 day cycle from dark of the moon to the dark of the moon, that's how we read sort of our calendar. That's looking up at the sky at night. You're basically looking at a wall calendar. Uh, some of the other teachings that we have, uh, I know they celebrate the first full moon in February, and that's when they leave their offering. But that ties in with another one, which is the, um, uh, the midwinter feast. And I think uh, one has sort of transitioned into that full moon celebration. And what you're doing is basically at the end of the winter, you're starting to run out of all your supplies. So what you're doing is as a community and all the different families in the community is you're pooling your resources to get through the hardest part of the month. That was a separate celebration altogether, but some people still follow that as the Feast of Apuganajit. And again, this god, he's a wizard, he's a Mi'kmaqsu, he's a shapeshifter. And when you leave your offering out for a Puganajit, it's like he can come in the form of any animal. It's like he could come as a blue jay, he could come as a crow, he could come as a squirrel, he could come as a fox. He's so clever, he could even come disguised as your neighbor's dog. It's like somebody is going to come to claim that offering that you've left. And we have a social media post where people will leave an offering and they'll send back in who a Puganajit came back. And they're like, well, Puganajit came to visit three times. Uh, the first time he was a chickadee, the second time he was a blue jay, and the third time he was a crow. <laughs> so they're going to definitely get their plates picked off. Uh, what we have for the, um, the midwinter feast is we've got an old meteor shower that used to take place. And back in the day, this meteor shower used to produce some hundred meteors um, in an hour, but it's sort of been decommissioned as a recognized uh, observation of a meteor shower because of something called celestial drift. And what you've got is you've basically got a comet that went through the Earth's path and it left a lot of debris and dust. And when the earth actually travels through that part of the path and through that little dust cloud, it shows a lot of meteor showers. But because of celestial drift, it sort of drifted a little bit out of our path. And now you're only seeing three to five um, meteors per um, hour. And you can literally do that at any night 
So once it becomes that co um, common, they stop that observation. And again, this sort of the little dust field or debris field that the path is on the path. And as it burns through those little things, they just leave that little uh, fallen star that you see. And, and again, with Mi'kmaq culture, everything that happens in the night sky is an observation of what happens here on earth. When the old Mi'kmaq saw a fallen star, they said that someone has passed away and that's their soul going to Wazo or Mi'kmaq heaven. And uh, even during times of meteor showers where there were several fallen stars and in one hour, it was said there's a battle going on somewhere and a lot of souls were lost. So these are some of the observations that we practiced. And again, it's definitely feast time where you're pooling all your resources. And again, March is the next month of the year and things get so much better then. It's like once the things start thawing out. Another thing about February is the full moon in February is considered the full snow moon. And it's also considered the full hunger moon because if you haven't prepared for this time of year, um, the biggest and heaviest snowfalls usually fall around the full moon in February. And the weather is so bad that you can't get out to fend for yourself. You can't go hunting. You can't go trekking, uh, checking your snares or your traps. So you go without if you haven't prepared for this. Again, the dark of the moon is when our month of the year begins. That's when the moon is located between the earth and the sun, directly in front of us. So it's receiving all the light of the sun is on the back of the moon and it literally goes black. Now, two weeks later, that moon is going to be directly behind us. And once it's directly behind us, it's it's absorbing all of the light from the sun. So it's fully, um, you can see the full circle of it and it's a full moon at that time. And again, 14 days in, 14 days out. And uh, you can definitely read what time of the year it is, just like reading a book, like, you know, in here in Nova Scotia or Canada or North America, we read from the um, left-hand side to the right-hand side. And that's like reading the moon. If the darkness is on the left hand side and the light is on the right, then you're moving into a full moon. If the light is on the um, left hand side and the darkness is on the right hand side, then you're moving into a, the new moon or um, the dark of the moon. So that there is just us looking up at our sky and seeing our moon and it being an important part of our monthly um, observations. Uh, you know how much time you've got before the next moon or for the next uh, thing to become available. February, like I said, that full moon in February is dumped on us uh, historically and has been recorded over time. We had White Lawn in 2004 and um, it dumped a lot of snow on us, as I'm sure a lot of us can remember. It fell during the full moon in February that year as well as 2013, we had a storm system that knocked out power in Eastern North America, and that's the Atlantic provinces, as well as the New England states. There was 500,000 people without power. So we're talking half a million people it affected. Uh, 2015, we literally had more snow than white one during that same moon cycle time. Uh, again, 2017, we were hit with a storm uh, this is 2019, we have pictures of Nova Scotia, uh, pictures, this is the worst storm in 65 years, so I'm only 63 years old, so I guess I never ever seen it that bad in 2020, there's Nova Scotia. Uh, this is Newfoundland back in uh, 2019, and you can see the snow banks are up over the Dodge Caravan there in the parking lot, and uh, in New Brunswick, <laughs> February 2020. They were literally snowboarding in the streets of uh, New Brunswick. So, and again, during the full moon of February, always prepare. Usually get a snow day for kids and stuff. So it's usually canceled in around there. Uh, this year, this uh, February 2023, we weren't hit with a lot of heavy snowfall, but we were hit with a polar vortex that took the temperatures down to minus 29 and with the wind chill it was minus 53. So again during that full moon 
in February, just even this year, that it was really, really bad. And again, March, that's when things are starting to thaw out. The ground is starting to release um, the frost. And then the moisture starts to move into the trees and the maple syrup, the sap is in tried there. Well, that there's the indicator for us to go collect our bark. Because at that time of the year, some of the bugs, like the firefly, will come out of winter hibernation. When he comes out of hibernation, you see this guy, that's when you return to the woods to collect the bark. Now, the thing is, you take a look. Uh, these are my two boys, my two sons. And in the background there, you can see there's no leaves on the trees yet, not in March. It's like, you know, the buds are just starting to swell. When you cut the bark at that time, it comes off in a nice thick plug and everything is all fused together. Uh, you use that for anything from wigwams to canoes to basketry. And what happens in the month of June, the energy cycle is uh, reversed in the tree and it's not coming from the ground to feed the leaves. It's coming from the leaves itself that are fully flushed, turning the sun's energy into food and coming back through the rest of the tree. But we'll talk about that in June. <laughs> uh, right now we're in April. So this is birds lay eggs time. And the laying of eggs was important to us because we didn't have domestic chickens laying our eggs. We basically had eggs as a seasonal treat. And it's whenever the birds laid the eggs. The geese, the ducks, the terns, the gulls, the partridges. It's like uh, even frog eggs themselves. Uh, it was told to me by our elders that uh, the Mi'kmaq ate frog eggs because there's protein and nourishment inside those eggs as well. And saying that you see crows and you see raccoons eating the gelatinal masses from the frog eggs, the people said that there must be some nutritional value to that. So we ate frog eggs. Then again, even in May uh, is frog croaking time. And the Mi'kmaq are thinking, well, that guy's croaking at this time of the year because, um, uh, because the ground sawed out. And it's like, well, who does, lives in the ground with the frog? And that's our eel. So when the Mi'kmaq hear the frogs chirping and singing, which probably they've been doing about a month now, thanks to global warming and climate change, uh, things are a little out of whack. But um, when we hear the frogs peeping, uh, we go eeling because we know that if the frogs are out, the eels are out as well. And eels don't sing. So you got to rely on the frogs to tell us. June. Tip of May, June. Uh, June is Nebicauicus, and Nebic is the leaves. So Nebicauicus is the time of the year that the leaves are in full bloom. And as I said before, this is when that firefly comes back again as an indicator. But this time it's during mating season. He's flying around with his little butt light on. And when he flies around with that little light, then you know it's time to go back in to harvest the bark. But Again, looking at the background of this image, you can see that the leaves are fully flushed in the month of June. And when you harvest the bark at this time, it comes off in seven different layers. And there are different layers on each side. And that's used for things like birch bark biting or porcupine quill work or um, paper flowers. Um, there's just different activities that we use the bark with at that time of year in the month of June. Uh, another thing, of course, is um, is National Aboriginal Day uh, in June 21st. That there is our summer solstice. And that's not just an arbitrary date that was set by the government to celebrate indigenous uh, people or indigenous culture. That's literally ours. Uh, during the sunrise ceremony, you notice that the sun doesn't pop up between the same two, tree or same two trees every day. Here's a tough question. You'll notice that it floats along the eastern horizon all the way to the northern part of the sky at June 21st. Then what happens after June 21st is the sun starts to go back down to the southern part of the eastern sky on December 21st, which is our winter solstice, and it's the shortest day of the year. I like talking to students and I tell them, when you guys are on summer vacation, it gets dark at 9, 30, 20 to 10, and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, but when you're on Christmas vacation, it gets dark at like four o'clock. They're like, yeah. 
And I'm like, and that's after daylight saving times. So you would literally be getting dark at 3 p.m. in the afternoon is when it would get dark. Then you start to realize like, yeah, okay, we don't really uh, observe these like the way the natives do, but just telling them that these were traditional days of celebration and Mi'kmaqs gathered in what was called days of reconciliation. Our, our elders teach us that we were never mad at anyone for six months at a time. It's like during these celebrations, you'd have community gatherings, you would go to someone you had a problem with and you would apologize and you'd be under community pressure to accept that apology, leaving the problems in the past so you can move forward. And that there is a very, very strong teaching that we still do today. Uh, the month of July, that's the month that the birds shed their feathers. And another observation in the month of July is Mi'kmaq do not enter the water for recreational use till the month of July. Plenty warm in May and June to go into the water, swimming and taking part in activities. But the Mi'kmaq say it's not your turn. May and June is being used by the bugs. It's being used by the frogs, reptiles, amphibians. Uh, it's being used by the fish. Uh, we're taught about our place in the cycle of life. It's like if you go in too early and you disturb, disrupt, or destroy, what's going to happen is the bugs won't be there to feed the frogs, the frogs won't be there to feed the trout, and the trout won't be there to feed you. So it's like knowing your responsibility and knowing your place in the cycle. It's not something that was set out exclusive from you that um, was, was developed to serve you. It's like we are part of the cycle. So anything we do to it is going to ultimately come back and uh, affect us. So that there is a teaching that Dr. Lillian Marshall from um, Bordeladec up in uh, Cape Breton, that was one of her strongest teachings is she loved what the education system did with the recycling program and the energy conservation program. And they said that the, or Lillian said that the school took it to the kids, the kids took it home, and now it's just a way of life. And she said that she'd love to see that with Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge and Mi'kmaq um, ecological knowledge and just that concept of our responsibility and our connection to everything else other than just the humans. Again, the saying is you're not allowed to enter the water in July until the waters are shocked. Uh, the shocking of the water actually purifies it. And with all the frogs and the polywogs and the gelatin eggs and the trout, everybody using the water in May and June, there's a lot of contaminants in the water. So if you go and drink that, you can actually get sick. So that's an important uh, teaching in itself. But after the lightning strikes the waters in July, and lightning does strike the earth here in Canada more times in the month of July than any other month of the year. And you can see like the number of strikes is almost double compared to any other time of the year. And what's happening is the Mi'kmaq knew that the lightning purified the water as well as the air. And it's that edamumptum part of two-eyed seeing, where it's like our Mi'kmaq view of what's going on, uh, sort of confirmed by the Western science world. And the Western science world is talking about the process of ozonation. Uh, water combines into units of two molecules. Um, when lightning strikes the water, it blasts them out singly. And what they'll do is they'll reunite into molecules of three. In the presence of ozone, water thinks it's ozone and they'll reconstruct themselves into this structure. Now, water will retain its electricity and its current for about 20 minutes or about 30 minutes. And uh, you can literally get a carriage if you touch water that's been struck by lightning. But what happens after this period is water realizes it's not lightning, so it expels one of the molecules. Now, the single molecules that are floating around, some will find each other and form another pure molecule of water, or what it will do is grab onto a contaminant, a bacterium or a germ, and chemically there's this mini micro explosion, 
because it can't contain itself singly. So when it blows up, it takes that contaminant with it and you're left with pure clean water again. And I can attest to that because there was a ball field between our house and, um, the, or I should say there was a frog pond between our house and the ball field and used to run by it in May and June because it stank so bad. It was just a contaminated water, had an odor to it. But after the waters were purified in the month of July, you go to the ball field and play ball for two hours and stop off at that frog pond for a drink. It was like that good, that refreshing. So it definitely is something that uh, we still observe is the not going into the water for recreational use till the first lightning strikes in the month of July. And again, August is ripening time. A lot of the berries, a lot of the fruits, everything's starting to come into season at that time. And that's what it's named after. Uh, this particular plant that you're seeing in is uh, the Sibigan or the Mi'kmaq um, uh, ground potato. And uh, this was our traditional food. It was like our potato before Europeans brought over the Irish variety of potatoes that we all eat today. But um, we have a potato here in North America. It's a lot smaller and it's a lot grainier. But uh, like, yeah, we had, that was our main source of carbohydrates, just like potatoes are today. Uh, the month that we did lose, that 13th month, we dropped the one in the middle of the summer. And now July and August are the hottest months of the year. And you got evaporation of moisture going up through the environment. It acts like a magnifying glass. And when the moon pops up, it's 16% bigger and it's 30% brighter. Um, that happens twice a year. It happens in summer and it happens in the month of December when crystallization of moisture in the atmosphere acts like a microscope or magnifying glass and it magnifies as well. So we had 13 months, we had two of these, we dropped the one in, um, in the middle of summer, but that was our missing 13th month. September, we got moose calling time. Um, moose are calling because they're looking for a mate. So this is their mate calling time. And even when, you, um, when you're calling a moose itself, it's like you're using a piece of birch bark that's probably about a foot long and you're calling through it. And you take a look at that moose's nose from, uh, from his eyeball to his snout. That's how big a moose call is. And with being moose calling time, that's literally what we're doing, is we're assimilating that call of the moose by making this sort of nostril size cone that will carry and uh, resonate the sound of the calling moose to call them for hunting season. Now, I work for Department of Natural Resources as a graphic artist for 25 years and uh, from, uh, I think, 79, 80 to, uh, to uh, 2005, uh, that's when I started my career with um, Department of Education. But uh, they used to give me a hard time about the natives hunting out of season and hunting before the, um, yeah, the provincial guidelines of hunting in November. It's like, yeah, these natives are out there like a month or two early than uh, the other non-native hunters. And I'm like, man, it's like, um, we hunt when the stars and the trees tell us. And they're like, oh yeah, Gerald's going all Indian on us. It's like, <laughs> so they used to tease me, but I was like, no, it's like, um, we've got a legend, we've got a story that talks about Moon and the seven bird hunters. And we're talking about the hunting season. And what we're talking about is a constellation of stars. And if you know anything about stars, you can see the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. So. We're looking toward the northern sky. Uh, over to the western part of the northern sky, you see the constellation of Buddhas that um, it combines with this to make our Mi'kmaq story of Moon and the Seven Bird Hunters. As the name suggests, the bird hunters are seven birds that are hunting the bear. And each one of these birds in the story is a different size, as well as the stars that are a different size in this constellation. The robin, the Canada jay, the passenger pigeon, and the blue jay are almost the same size, and the stars are almost the same size. The two smallest stars in the constellation are um, represented by a chickadee, 
and a little saw with owl. And again, the largest star that's in the constellation is represented by the barred owl, which is the largest bird in the story. Now, the reason it takes place at this time of year is this legend says that four of the hunters lost their trail. That means that four of the stars are underneath the horizon line now. So there's only three of those hunters that are pursuing the bear. And what happens is the lead hunter, oh, I should say, uh, <clears throat> we have a point of reference for our nighttime stories. I mean, the planet Earth is continually rotating and the night sky is continually rotating. Our point of reference is the darkest hour of the night, which is about 4 to 4 um, a.m. in the morning. And as the Earth turns away from the sun, it gets darker and darker and darker until the moon start, or the Earth starts to um, move into the morning uh, sunlight, and then it starts to get lighter and lighter. That point of reference where the sky is the darkest and you can see the deepest into space, because the darker it gets, the more stars you see. And then at one certain point, you start to see less and less stars and you start to see that. That's our point of reference for storytelling. It's not just like looking at the sky at like nine or 10 o'clock at night. It's like, no, you gotta go to the darkest part of the sky. And again, depending on light pollution, whether you're living in a city or whether you're living farther out into the burbs there, uh, you see in more and more stars as light pollution has less of a reaction with the contrast. So, but um, as I said, that just depends on where you live. And again, it's not halfway through the night. The, like the old saying says, it's always darkest before the dawn. And uh, it's not like when the sun goes down and when the sun pops up, it's like halfway through. It's like, no, it's closest to those morning hours, like 4, 4.30 a.m. That is the very, very darkest. But again, our story, going back to our story, the robin is the lead hunter. He's the archer, he's got a bow, he's got a quiver, and just like any other archer, he's got an attitude. And again, he shoots the bear. The bear's blood stains the robin's chest red, robin redbreast. Robin redbreast shakes the blood off of his feathers and he turns the leaves red in the trees. The trees turning red in the fall is the indication for the hunt to begin. And that's not, a connect, not only connected to the night sky stories or the months of the year, but it's also connected to the nutrition cycle. Because what's happening is animals are starting to feed and get ready for winter. So once they start to um, feed, the nutritional value definitely goes up. So that's why we hunt when we do hunt, is because we follow the nutrition cycle and not just like a, a date that was set by the government. Again, the nutritional value is very strong at that time. The meats are very, very strong. You can hunt all fall, you can hunt all winter. But in the springtime again, you stop doing that because the nutritional value of the meat in fur-bearing animals or from the fur-harvesting animals and the um, meat-bearing animals, it starts to drop in the spring because that nutritional value is going to feed the next year's brood. It's like all the little ones. That's where the nutritional value is going and the nutrition depletes in the meats. So we stop hunting and then we go back into fishing season. <laughs> and by the time October, before these animals turn into hibernation, a lot of them are very, very bulked up. They're very, very lackadaisical, uh, less likely to get chased down by a bear in October than you would in March or April. So um, that's uh, something to consider. Uh, I know that this um, word represents like, you know, fat, tame animals. But I don't like to talk to kids about like, you know, these animals being tame because they get the wrong idea of what that means. But uh, yeah, that is the Mi'kmaq word for October, and that refers to the fattening of the animals before hibernation. Uh, another thing that happens in the month of October is in the dark of the moon in October, which is the very, very first of the 10th month, 
um, when the moon is between the earth and the sun, you get the increased gravitational pull of the sun's gravity combined with the moon's gravity on the water shear and earth. What happens is during any dark of the moon, the tide is going to rise and it's going to rise higher. You fish come in with the tides, you lay down your traps, you're only going to get a certain amount. The dark of the moon in October is the highest tides of the year. The water levels rise higher, the fish go farther upstream. So when you lay your traps down, you're getting the major load of the year. And that there is harvest time for the fish stocks and it's feast time to feast before the winter. And another thing is it's time to dry the meat for um, winter use. Now the indicator for that is the singing of the grasshoppers and the crickets. Now when I was a young fellow going to school, I knew that when I heard the grasshoppers and crickets in August start singing, it's like I get kind of sad because I'm like summer vacation's over and we're going back to school. But the Mi'kmaq, we're listening for the night, not that the singing starts, we're listening for the month of October when the singing stops. Because when the grasshoppers and the crickets stop singing in the month of October, that means maintenance season's over and they're going into egg laying time. And for an insect like a grasshopper or a cricket to lay a moist, delicate little egg to last on to next season's brood, that means that there's no humidity in the air. You can't do it too early if your meat will rot. And when I talked about the dark of the moon providing that big stock load of fish and the grasshoppers and crickets stop singing, that's the time for you to gather and dry your fish. That way you've got protein that'll last all through the winter and through the harshest months. So these are all the reasons why we have these names of the calendar is they're because they're connected to a way of life that our people have lived here for thousands and thousands of years. And it still plays out. It's like looking at the environment, looking at the cycles. I mean, the stock of fish definitely isn't as high as it used to be, but um, there's still people that do that. It's like um, that, that's what they rely on. Like um, down in uh, the valley in Nova Scotia, I know that there's eel weirs. And again, they're eeling in the dark of the moon in October. Uh, November, uh, November is one we're going to have to relook at, I think, and re explore. Uh, Keptikeukus means the times the rivers freeze. When I was a little boy growing up in the 50s and the 60s, the waters did freeze in the month of November because I can remember distinctively thinking about getting a new pair of skates or a new hockey stick for Christmas. And so I was on the brook in November skating. Uh, now that doesn't happen. And again, because of global warming and climate change, it's definitely something that we have to work with. Uh, Department of Natural Resources had the climate change conference back in the 80s. And the organizers had the foresight to invite the Mi'kmaq elders and when the elders were there at the meeting and they were talking about climate change and global warming, they asked the Mi'kmaq what they thought about global warming. And Dr. L uh, Dr. Medina Marshall from Eskasoni, uh, she took the podium and she just stood there and she said, you want to know what we think about global warming? He said, we come from a verb-based language. And when you say something, it means when. She said, we have June bugs in May. We have May flowers in April, and we have April showers in March. And you could literally hear a pin drop when people realize, yeah, this isn't just a, a tree hugger's myth. It's like global warming and climate change is literally here. And uh, that really put it into perspective from the verb-based language and from the elders' way of looking at things. But like I said, we need a new moon, our new name for the month of November. And again, I talked about the plant hardiness zones earlier. Um, way down in the valley, they're two weeks ahead of us. I'm here in Central Nova, right in the community of Millbrook, in uh, right outside of the town of Truro. Um, we're two weeks ahead of you guys up there in Cape Breton. So if you've got a plant that is in season for two weeks of the year, uh, we were semi-nomadic. We moved around to different places at different times. 
we had a winter home, we had a summer home, we had a coastal home to take advantage of um, seashells during the summertime. It's like we moved semi-nomadically, but we always came back to the same place. So we had to have sort of consideration for um, returning to this place and not overtaking things. Uh, that knowledge is even still used today. And I give you an example from my wife. I was coming on to the end of the summer and my wife said, I want another feed of corn before the corn is gone. She said, don't go to Avery's. She said, Avery gets all their produce from the valley and their corn is done. She said, you go to a local market like Mastown Market or River Breeze Market, you're going to get corn that's still fresh. <laughs> so this is sort of just the way of still looking at that old traditional knowledge. Even today, it's like we can still learn from it. But um, I, yeah, that's just uh, the climate changes. And uh, I know even Cape Breton's got such a short season that it doesn't have a lot of the plants and vegetation that they have on the mainland. Even to the point that uh, I did a book for um, for um, identification of insects, and of course the the big language people are from and from Cape Breton. So I took the bugs up to Cape Breton. And they're like, "Oh God!" It's like we don't have those things around here. <laughs> and so like even the the plants that don't grow there, they don't have the predatory animals that feed on those um, those plants that don't grow there. So uh, things like cicadas or uh, uh, spittle bugs, it's like, no, season in Cape Breton is too small for that. Although some people, when I've talked about cicada and the singing of the cicada, the Cape Bretoners were like, I remember that. So I heard that when I was down in Maine picking blueberries. <laughs> so uh, yeah, they do have sort of a connection to the environment no matter where they went. <laughs> and again, I spoke to you about December being the chief's moon. And again, crystallization of moisture in the environment, making the moon seem bigger and brighter. And again, that there is our shortest day of the year. And after December 21st, it sort of goes back to the other part as days start to get longer. Now, I know that uh, our celebrations of the winter solstice have sort of morphed into the uh, Christian religion with our celebrations of Christmas now. And it's not as prominent a thing in Mi'kmaq culture because everybody's uh, uh, sort of been baptized and go into the Roman Catholic uh, religion. And Christmas is a bigger part of that than in our old traditional one, but it's still there. And some people still don't. And again, that's uh, looking at our ecological calendar right from January to December and the different activities that we took part in. And again, looking at Edamumptum and uh, Two-Eyed Seeing, you've got that indigenous knowledge and way of looking at things combined with the Western science to give us that Two-Eyed Seeing. And uh, yeah, I want to thank you, I guess, at this time. I don't know if we got uh, any time for questions or whether... Or, whoop, there we go. There we go. So there, anything that anyone had to chat line or anything anybody have any questions uh thank you gerald a couple minutes i think boy i'm getting it tight <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah um so you you kept referring to um the you know the global warming and it how it's how it's changed uh when things happen are are, are the Mi'kmaq as a people looking at adjusting your calendar to no. the new global no no not at all in fact uh, a lot of them go stay old school they don't want to they don't they don't like change <laughs> it's like don't need to change so the world needs to change we don't <laughs> so, yeah like, but uh but i don't know it's all part of the cycle i guess big more concept of everything is in a constant state of flux even looking at your blouse there it's like it's not red it's in the state of being red it was redder before, and it'll be less red in the future. But that, that <laughs> idea of constant change, it's like, uh, yeah, it's like that's very much a part of the way they look at things. So, no, they leave the language alone, and it's like, that's what it's going to be. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Frost, Eva Frost in, her, in the chat Eva had a question Frost. for you. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, in July, there were two terms. Why? Two terms in July. No, there was no, that was um that was July followed by the missing month. That was the thirteenth oh. one that we got rid of. And um, Adiakus Adiakus is halfway moon because we don't start our year in January. Our year starts in March, so we go six months into the middle, and then there's six months after. So Adiakus is basically halfway moon, and uh, that's the one that we got rid of. But the, yeah, it did say July, and then there was two. I know what she means. But yeah, it's the month of July and the missing month, our 13th. Yeah, we used to do science camps in Bodledeck up in Cape Breton, and, and Dr. Lillian Marshall used to invite us in, as well as elders from uh, other Mi'kmaq communities. You know, uh, Becky Julian from Indian Brook was one of the main resource people for science. and. Um, she uh, was invited into these gatherings up in Cape Breton. And even this year, we're celebrating AMTEC, which is the Atlantic Native Teachers Education Conference in Eskasoni. Uh, we'll be doing that, I do believe, in May. And um, yeah, that's something that takes place. Then we have Old Louis Sultanage. Uh, there are two education conferences that switch from one year to the other. They're, they're always, uh, these events are always two years apart, but there's always something going on. And of course, representation from um, publishers, publishing companies. Uh, I did a series of books with the Scholastics Book Club for Kids. And um, I did another series through Rubicon on Mi'kmaq Legends. And those people are usually there selling their books as well. And I know that the libraries around here, they're, they're well stocked with indigenous books. My book, my bug book, Jujich, I did with my wife, Natalie and um, Ernest Johnson and um, and his wife, um, Miney Johnson from Eskasoni. So many trips up to Cape Breton to, to combine all that knowledge and to get all that knowledge. It's been fun. I even just produced a series of seven books for children on, um, on Mi'kmaq language of animals. And there's different ones, there's, we've got a, book on bugs, we got a book on fish, we got a book on mammals, uh, even farm animals and domestic animals. Um, yeah, everything. And having fun illustrating books. It's all I'm good for. <laughs> so did I lose somebody? Oh, there we go. No, um, you just uh, thank you so much, Gerald. This has been fantastic. Oh, you're um, very welcome. I didn't know any of this, and 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 I've lived <laughs> here all my life. <laughs> so it's actually really interesting because it actually also puts the news stories you get on on the news in perspective when they're talking about, as you said, um, do it, hunting in different seasons and yeah. the, the designated seasons and stuff. Um, yeah. That that now we understand why that's happening. Yeah. Um, well, the reverse happens in fishing season. I mean, they started the fishing in April 1st and you go to the rivers, you'll see them lined with 50, 70 fishermen. It's like, but there's no native fishermen. It's like, no, it's not time yet. The fish aren't there. <laughs> it's like uh, the, the bubbles, they come in two forms. Uh, you got white bubbles that have been tossed over and they oxidize and they form white bubbles. But later on, in like two weeks from now, you're going to notice that the bubbles are pink. And the reason why they're pink is because the water is mixed with the um, fat that's in all the fish. You get thousands and thousands of shad and bass and salmon in the water. They're excreting oils that mix with there. And when they roll in the Bay of Funday, it turns that water sort of pink. And because it's got oil in it, there's an odor to it and it attracts flies. But you can't see the flies on the water and the bubbles far away. But you can see the birds picking off the bugs. And it's like two weeks from now, you'll see he's like, oh, that, yeah, we hunt them two months early, but we fish two weeks later. So, it's like, yeah. it's <laughs> so everybody now, <laughs> everybody here in the Atlantic now knows when to go get your fish. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And in two like, weeks time. <laughs> that's right. And again, strawberry blossoms will be coming out. And it's like when that strawberry blossom is at the right temperature for it to blossom, then that's when the fish come in. It's like. So we see for strawberry blossoms, we go fishing. <laughs> Fantastic. 
Well, thank you so much, Gerald. Uh, like I said, I've learned a whole bunch, and it looks like from the uh, from the chat, everybody else has learned a lot from from your presentation today. I I I mean, every time you share, I just feel like I've learned so much more than I ever learned in school. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, they didn't teach me any of this in school either. Yeah. yeah. Unless I was homeschooled. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording.